Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now let's turn to Nigeria, the other economic giant in Africa and potentially one of the biggest drivers of growth for the region. Like many other countries around the world, we just heard about South Africa's massive contraction. Nigeria's economy is struggling amid the coronavirus pandemic. Economists from the World Bank have warned that the oil-rich country could be on the its worst recession since the 1980s because of the fluctuation in oil prices coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic. There have been currency-induced inflation surges and many businesses have been hard hit. Tens of millions of Nigerians are poor or unemployed and the minority who have the spending power have seen their finances take a battering because of the COVID pandemic. The prediction is that these are hard times for businesses and things are set to get harder for the majority of Nigerians. Although Nigeria has yet to attain the 20th position in the world economy and the economy is not growing at double digit, it is however safe to state that the implementation of ERGP pulled the economy out of recession onto the path of economic growth as the economy experienced 11 quarters of consecutive GDP growth since exiting recession. Well, for more on the challenges facing the Nigerian economy, I'm joined now from our Lagos studios by the economist Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu, who served twice as Nigeria's finance minister and who was also minister of national planning and minister of transportation, respectively. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, um, Dr. Kalu. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you. Charles. Okay, thank you ever so much for joining us. And we've just been talking about that enormous contraction of the South African economy. And I'd like now to turn to the Nigerian economy. But before we get into detail, just set out for us the differences between the Nigerian and the South African economies. Presumably one is more industrialized than the other, but the other has a bigger market and therefore bigger growth potential? Well, the, the difference is uh, really in terms of size of GDP. By the time you break down the GDP into the various major sectors, you can see that uh, clearly uh, the South African economy is deeper, is more structurally uh, organized than the Nigerian economy. But very importantly, in terms of what we want to talk about, is that uh, South Africa has been much more in the forefront in terms of uh, travel and tourism. And that also reflects how the current crisis will have affected Nigeria, despite the fact that we have a, a larger GDP. Uh, the effect might be a little less in some sense, but in other ways, of course, it can be much more long lasting because the fact that so many resources are not really fully mobilized in the first instance. And of course, we have other issues, constitutional issues, security issues, as well as the major infrastructural issues, which should really have been standing us in good stead as we headed into this uh, COVID crisis. Well, I mean, from your point of view, uh, Dr. Kalu, I mean, you, you've been a finance minister twice. You've been minister of transportation, minister of national planning. I mean, you've bestrode policy making in this country, arguably like no other. I mean, d does it seem to you like nothing's changed since you were in government? Well, uh, not much has really changed. Uh, in a positive sense. Of course, in terms of uh, sheer magnitude, obviously the GDP has grown somewhat, but uh, the more important areas of structural change in terms of um, changing the product mix with the basic industry, basic sectors like agriculture and industry, not much has really happened for obvious reasons. Maybe we can get into that. So uh, it's always difficult to say. Uh, we. We lost so many opportunities over the last 30 years, if you like, 
Uh, I accept that you might say I bestrode the area for a while, but it's for a very short time when you really total it up. It's true one was coming with lots of, incentive, of uh, uh, policy measures that sh we should have implemented during the short period we are talking about restructuring the economy. And then uh, in the phases of privatization, these were all vehicles for making sure that uh, we were in fact going to be growing at a much faster pace, given the size of growth of our population, the growth of the labor force, and the potential to really uh, move from raw material or small uh, degrees of valorization of these raw materials into complex industrial production. We didn't do that. And of course, this has to do with so many things, technical training, education, social mobilization in the, in the larger sense, uh, security, peace, and uh, fast movements of uh, persons, goods, and services from one part of the country to the, to the other because of the death of uh, major uh, transport structures which are put in place like train services, coastal ports, and so on and so forth. So we have had all kinds of constraints that have impeded the, the potential high growth of the economy. I actually, by the mid-70s, I had envisaged that this economy could have been growing at 10% or more in real terms over the next uh, 10, 15 years. The kind of thing we saw in China in our own sense, you know, this was possible. But uh, political shifts, policy, so-called policy somersaults and certain inconsistency have been constraints, definitely, on the deepening of the Nigerian economy. Well, I, I think uh, that's a point that uh, I, I think will will um, hit home with many people, analysts, and so on. Um, the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, of course, being one of them, um, the, 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 the think tank has raised a lot of issues that are problematic in the Nigerian economy. It just issued a 15 point um, sort of statement um, and everything from a huge gap in meeting food requirements so the high level of insecurity you touched on that rising poverty unemployment the one crop oil economy distortions in the liquidity and interest rate management of nigeria's financial system etc i mean pick any one of those or all of those and give us your assessment well, for a while, I've always said that uh, we provided the best crucible for looking into the phases of development, the phases of management, uh, maintaining uh, institutional growth, because the growth of institutions, I mean, some of our international uh, partners always emphasize the critical role of institutions. But uh, that goes more than just institutions. It goes to personnel. From personnel, it goes to the formal and informal training and uh, post-training uh, tutelage in various uh, kinds of uh, structures. So the problems are all there. It's a question of which ones you want to really focus on. Now, you talked about uh, the management of the exchanges, for instance. We, we seem to have not really gotten that in hand to the extent that up to now we are still arguing as to whether it is the IMF that requires us to adjust our exchange rate or interest rates and so on. These are things that should really have gotten under our belt because, as I said, well, having been from there myself, you know, I was at the World Bank several times. Well, the, those institutions tell the clients, these are the problems you solve for your own good. It is not for the interest of the international institution. So we entered COVID not having solved some of these major problems. And uh, a few weeks ago, I think I was on this medium and I tried to emphasize the fact that we needed to really uh, a, a pick a, a definite time frame. Let's say two months, shut down effectively and a plan effectively to provide the uh, palliatives to survive uh, for those period. And then we allow the, 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 the virus to sort of uh, pass us by as it were. But well, we didn't really do it, as you were just talking about the South African one. Uh, it is not so much the shutdown, but it is shutdown that has to be properly planned. What are the resources that you need to keep people shut down? Whatever resources you have, you rate, retreat it to the point where you can really afford to do it, and then it will be very effective. 
And when you plan it, it will not uh, sort of disrupt the, the, the return to uh, normalcy whenever that will come about. So we entered uh, COVID not having resolved so many problems. You hear the constitutional questions are still very high up in the agenda. You hear about the security issues, all these uh, much talked about killings. And it's not just talked about to get evidences every once in a while. We don't know to the extent that these incidents are really accurately reported, which is sad because we should really have fairly accurate reporting. The police, the army, the government is in all parts of the country, but yet we have a bit of a problem putting our fingers on what is actually happening. Now, if you don't know what is happening, you can't have a handle of security. If there is insecurity, you can't expect people to move about from their farms to, their fa to the factories, uh, to industries in the towns and cities and so on and so forth. So that is absolutely critical. Now, the question about the financial mon uh, exchange and monetary instruments are absolutely necessary to guide investors who want to move from just producing uh, the raw materials into stages of uh, manufacturing, some for domestic use and some for export. These are all uh, decisions that should be taken in a fairly stable monetary fiscal balance of payments environment. So we've had problems there too. So as I said, we, we have all of these problems. We cannot say we've really got any under our belt. But still, um, when you are in Nigeria, you get a sense that things are not quite as bad as they look from the outside. Uh, you know, some of these things come up every once in a while, but there's a relative calm uh, and then you get it disrupted every, every once in a while. So now you go down to other infrastructures, water supply, power supply, uh, transportation, uh, movement of large goods and services by train, which so many countries, even in Africa, already have. We are still struggling with those. So this requires a very concerted uh, emphasis at the federal level, at the state level, at the level of uh, business, the business community, and so on and so forth. So yes, there's no question that our size is some kind of an impediment, but a little bit of more planning will make things a lot better in Nigeria. Well, I mean, you, you've obviously set this out very comprehensively, and um, you've mentioned a lot of things that are absolutely problematic. Um, and obviously, I mean, many people would agree with that, but of all of the lot, as it were, of all of them, um, if you were in a position of sort of making decisions about what happens to the Nigerian economy today, which do you think needs to be at the top of the priority list? Which would be the top of your entry? And we've got about a minute before we have to take a break. Right. Well, I think the constitutional issues, because I think you should consider that uh, strangely a low-hanging fruit. From the top, we should be able to call in the, the various leaders and resolve the constitutional issue. Which way do we want to go? You see, when you saw that out, that, that relieves a lot of tension in terms of uh, decision making, in terms of uh, resource allocation, or if you like, distribution. It will also resolve simultaneously a measure of the safety that is so uh, urgently needed. So I would say the constitutional issues we should really put behind us. We've talked about this for so long. Along with that is the security, which is related to it. If you remove, if you deal with those two, I think uh, you'll be in a better position to tackle any deficiencies in our sectoral policies, in our infrastructural policies, in our heavy transport sector, including uh, the macro issues of uh, where do we borrow? How do we borrow? And how do we apply the borrowing that we do? Okay, I apologize, uh, Dr. Those, Dr. Kalu, I've but I'm going to interrupt you there because we have to take a break. But we do stay with us. We'll keep talking. Uh, you're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with a former two-time Nigerian Minister of Finance, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu, about the challenges facing the Nigerian economy. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Zanyakul. Now, Nigeria's leading policy think tank, the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, has issued a 15-point statement on the current state of Nigeria's economy. The statement covers the country's key sectors, assessing the policy steps and reforms that have been carried out by the Buhari administration. It also proffers solutions to some of the socio-economic challenges facing Nigeria. It notes that a huge gap still remains in meeting the country's food requirements despite the budgetary allocations and huge sums of money disbursed by the Nigerian Central Bank. The NESG also expresses concern about the high level of insecurity across Nigeria and its impact on the business environment and the flow of investment. Concern has also been raised about Nigeria's huge exposure to the vagaries of oil price fluctuations and the growing level of poverty, unemployment and underemployment in the country. And the economist, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu, who served twice as Nigeria's finance minister and who was also minister of national planning and minister of transportation, respectively, is still with me from our Lagos studios. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Kalu, for staying with us. Um, I, I, let's talk about some of the other things um, as we continue to assess the Nigerian economy, um, I suppose, in the last, you know, few decades and under the Buhari administration. Are you impressed with the level of infrastructural development across Nigeria? I mean, the NESG has been commending the Buhari government on its efforts there, although it urges the government to explore many more options to meet the large financial resources needed to repair uh, this country's decayed and decaying infrastructure. Well, I have not seen the NESG report. I definitely will try and get hold of it. Um, and um, it's better for us to always look look positive, look forward. So I don't uh, criticize anybody commenting commending the government. But there's no gain saying the fact that uh, most Nigerians think that we should be doing so much, much better. We should be moving so much faster. We should be spreading the benefits of growth so much more evenly. We should mobilize resources to provide schools, health, you know, other facilities. And when you do, of course, the whole mobilization uh, can uh, increase to the to a commensurate size that, uh, that uh, beyond what we are now, we are really more like at the very bottom in terms of social mobilization for obvious reasons. Um, a government can mobilize a lot when it shows that it can also uh, deliver services, goods and services, then it's easy to mobilize. But when you don't deliver these goods and services, uh, it will not be surprising if uh, you end up uh, relying rather too easily on the captive source of income like uh, oil revenues and so on and so forth. Well, so this is it. I agree that they certainly uh, are doing a lot to repair some of the things that uh, we have already, and they have taken a few initiatives, but some of us have been retired for a while, so what we just obliged to come in and discuss these issues. But I think that there is no gain saying the fact that with the size of our economy, with the revenue potential we have, and the leverage potential of that revenue base, we should be financing a lot more. We only need to move around and see how many dilapidated schools, whether primary, secondary, uh, and uh, higher education that we have. You, you need to also see the, the almost absence of health insurance, health facilities, uh, the question of uh, durable roads, all season roads, and definitely a very striking uh, absence of uh, good railroads, such that you can see now in East Africa, in Southern Africa, and so on. Uh, we tried to start that when I was Minister of Transport, but somehow we didn't do it. I'm not going to go blaming anybody or go into all the details, but there is no question that we are very, very far from where we should be, even though everybody knows that you cannot uh, lay the blame on any particular regime or any particular time frame. But uh, given the fact that the resources are still there, we have the minerals, we have the solid minerals, we have the uh, agricultural potential, which we've been mouthing for 50 years. 
and therefore the, the capacity to do so much more in industry so that we don't begin to talk about being a mono economy. Nigeria has no business ever having to describe itself as a money economy from the start. In those days, uh, before the 50s, of course, we depended on several uh, agricultural products, aside from tin, columbite, coal, and so on and so forth. So you will have thought by now we have, will have uh, diversified quite effectively. But to do that, you need to uh, create the environment for higher savings, put domestic savings, induce foreign investment, rely on the international institutions that have provided uh, medium and long-term funds to fund those heavy capital goods that require, you know, five, ten years uh, period for construction before repaying and so on and so forth. But to do that, you have to have the policies that will encourage those institutions to put in their money there. And Nigeria had no problem there because of the sheer size of the economy. And everybody was sure that the prospects were so good. And then we came in with all our rambunctious politics that uh, just seemed to have uh, uh, diluted all that potential from being realized. Right, okay, we've just got so a, a couple effect, of minutes before we, um, before we, we've got a couple of minutes before we have to go, Dr. Carlo, and I want to be able to get in two crucial questions to you before we have to leave. So if you could um, keep the, the answers reasonably short, I'd appreciate it. One, you talked about the um, availability of funds from a lot of the agencies and so on. Um, a huge elephant in the room that's causing considerable disquiet in Nigeria um, is the resort to borrowing, both domestic and international, which appears to have become, you know, the way sort of along with quantitative easing to fund the large deficit that's now been made worse by the COVID pandemic. I mean, the NESG also raised that as a major issue. Do you share that concern? Well, you know, like we say, you're talking about a general equilibrium situation. All these things are interconnected. For a size of Nigeria's borrowing, <laughs> it, you have to go a long way bef because before you begin to talk about it's too, being too heavy for the revenue or for the GDP. So we are talking about the terms of the borrowing, the effectiveness of the use of borrowing, rather right, than the absolute size. You have to have people who understand what they want. Uh, you cannot go blaming the creditor when those who are negotiating this may not be quite prepared to know how to make sure, they, as they say in these days, the best deals for the country. So it is not the absolute size that's the problem. It's the borrowing pattern, the use of the funds. Because when you use the funds properly, as before you borrow, you will have spread out your you know, revenues and costs in terms of repayment. It's only when there's a significant margin between the two that you should borrow in the first place. And once you've done it, you make sure that you allocate your resources to realize the benefits that you, you provide. If you borrow uh, casually and uh, if you don't manage it properly, if your priorities are wrong, then of course you can talk in absolute size and say you, you had no business borrowing maybe 50% of what you've already borrowed. So my contention is that we really need to look at the leadership, leadership manage those who negotiate, those who implement. Okay, let, let me just leap in there, uh, Dr. Carla, because I want to get this in before we have to leave in about a minute or so. The big topical issue, and arguably the very current one, apart from the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, is the deregulation of fuel and electricity prices. Are you convinced that beyond price deregulation, all the reforms that are needed to ensure that the, those sectors are working smoothly, are being effectively implemented? No, I'm not satisfied that they are. And uh, I, let me just say one thing. As I said, everything is macroeconomics in a sense, dynamic macroeconomics. It is the exchange rate at times that is the joker in that pack. If you do not manage the exchange rate, you can see differentials between your domestic prices and the border price, which is what creates the subsidy and gives the impression that uh, things are not quite deregulated. So we need to look at the entire macro picture before we can draw a conclusion. We have to manage the exchange rate. To do that, yes, to do that, you have to make sure that you are 
filling the gas properly from okay. domestic resources and the appropriate foreign exchange complement to okay. those resources. Do Dr. Kahlo, so I you really can make sure appreciate that the time that you've given us and the patience that you've had with us. Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu was a uh, two-time Nigerian finance minister who also served as Minister of National Planning and Minister of Transportation. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow. From me and the entire team here in Abuja, Johannesburg and Lagos, bye-bye and thank you for watching.